This is a Geek Nerd Podcasts production. All songs, sound effects, and themes are used under fair use copyright. Follow at Geek Nerd Pod on Twitter to keep up with all of Geek Nerd Podcast's projects, and join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash geek nerd with tiers starting at $1 a month. Be sure to check out the Geekly's Facebook page at, you guessed it, facebook.com forward slash the Geekly. As always, the best support is word of mouth. If you like our shows, subscribe, leave a review, tell your friends, drop us a note on Twitter. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Podcast Away. My name is Jules, in case you've never listened to Podcast Away before. It's a show where I invite a guest on to talk about the nine pieces of visual media that they will be stuck in an isolation situation with. Media can include films, TV shows and computer games, minimum of two per category, and they also get to choose their isolation situation. They also get to pick one luxury item, and they also get to pick a third book to go along with Watchmen and 1001 Films to Watch Before You Die. Today's guest is Ross Chapman from I Understood That Reference podcast. How are you doing today, Ross? Hello, hello. Um, am I okay to call you Jules? Yeah, please call me Jules. Everyone does. That's all right then. I am I am part of everyone, so I shall also do that. You can call me Julian if you're ever pissed off with me. So yeah, how are you doing today? Um, I'm very, very good. It's, it's an absolutely beautiful day here in uh, Dublin. Really, really sunny. Unfortunately, of course, we can't really go outside too much to enjoy it. But look, it's just, there's a park very, very near my house, as in literally right in front of my house. So at least I can kind of get a walk around that. So it's, it's beautiful and I'm feeling good. Good. I absolutely love Dublin. I've been there several times. My family in Ireland come from Banaslow, County Galway. Ah, yes, I know Banaslow. Do you? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, I've been there 40 times maybe in my life. Um, yeah, we used to go there, I think, three times a year, throughout, all throughout my childhood. And then we'd used to go up to Dublin, you know, for a special occasion. So, yeah, I absolutely love Ireland, love Dublin. And, uh, yeah, just thrilled to have you here today. Um, you do the I Understood That Reference podcast, and so I was just wondering if you could tell everybody a little bit about it. Sure thing. Um, so the I Understood That Reference podcast that I do with my friend Rob, um, we're like a pop culture, movie, video game, comic kind of chat show, basically, where it's just me and him, two, two Irish guys, chilling out and chatting about things, offering a slightly differing perspective maybe than you get from other pop culture kind of podcasts, purely because we're both Irish. So, and we, we just have a fun and we play games. We try to make it interactive. So we try to do quizzes people can take part in as well. So it's just about having fun, talking about movies and stuff and bringing up the occasional Irish gem that maybe people won't have heard so much about. Do you know the rules of the game, Ross, that we're about to play? So I am, I am intimately familiar with the rules of the game today. I've, I've listened to a good few of the, the other episodes. Somebody mentioned the X-Men animated cartoon and I was like, ah, oh, god damn it, that's a great, that's a freaking great choice. <laughs> so, but uh, yes, I, I know what I'm, what I'm up against and I know what I have to do today. So I'm, I'm ready for this. Fantastic. What we'll do is we'll start by talking about your apocalyptic scenario and the kind of isolation that you find yourself in because People who may have listened to um, Desert Island Discs, everybody that goes on that program, they're all on their little desert island, totally stranded. And I've wanted to give everybody the option of creating their own scenario and allowing them full freedom to decide where it is that they will be spending their isolation. No contact with the outside world, no chance of escape. So these nine pieces of media, uh, the luxury item and the book are kind of they are gifts I'm giving this person to stop them from going fucking crazy and, you know, going postal, essentially. So let's talk about your apocalyptic scenario and your, you know, the situation that you find yourself in. So it's it's weird talking about an apocalyptic scenario when we kind of are living in a, in a weird apocalyptic scenario of sorts. So I'm, I'm going to veer away from any kind of virus stuff or zombie nation stuff. And I'm going to go for what I believe realistically is going to happen to the world at some point. And that's a robotic cybernet slash cyberdyne controlled machines taking over and absolutely laying waste to, to humanity uh, apocalyptic nightmare scenario that, I, that I've somehow found myself in. The way I've survived, which I think is key here because it plays into my, my Irish heritage, is that I'm from a place called Leash, which is the literal middle of nowhere in Ireland. So 
if the machines are going to be looking at high value targets and places that they probably should look to take out, judging by the average use of technology, Leash is probably fairly low on the pecking order of places they need to go to. And I am going to use that to my advantage. So there's lots of fields around where I live, around my house down the country. So I'm essentially just going to get out there as soon as things go pretty bad. I'm going to dig myself a bunker under a nice big field and just be myself there and, and you know, survive this unholy machine war. I love how much thought you've put into it. And as I keep telling everybody that takes part in this show, I came up with this idea. I think it was like September time. And we did the first conversation was with Lex, my kind of podcast uh, co-host. And so, yeah, there was no trace of any isolation. There was no trace of any kind of apocalypse that was happening. Um, so, yeah, it's it's all a bit too real now. So I can only <laughs> apologise to everybody in advance. I hope I didn't cause this to happen. I mean, I didn't want to say it. I didn't want to say it, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I jinxed us all. But yeah, I, I love your idea. And... Um, yeah, I think a bunker is a good one. A bunker is very, a uh, very enclosed space, very safe, but it's the kind of thing where, you know, you can't necessarily see the sky, no fresh air. So you need these pieces of electronic media to kind of stop you going crazy. Also, I was just thinking, it, it being like the countryside, I'm sure I could also work out a pretty decent fil fil filtration system. You know, Ireland rains pretty much all the time, get myself fresh water, like it's it works it just it works it absolutely does work yeah i think i think you could live a long and happy life there maybe one day when you're feeling optimistic you might pop the hatch you might kind of look out and uh, there might be a rainbow in the sky and uh, somehow all the robots have uh, gone there is that issue though that it is ireland is well leash anyway is kind of barren so i might be like has the apocalypse gone past or is is this just is it the same? Not not to badmouth leash, but you know, that's how it is. <laughs> At any given day, it looks like the apocalypse is happening there. Essentially. <laughs> okay, let's move on to your choices. What have you got for us first? Right, I'll start with one that I know that everybody, well, most people will have seen, and that's uh, Ghostbusters, the original from 1984, because it is a sheer, unadulterated classic, and perhaps my favourite movie of all time. For those who've been living under a rock for the past, you know, 30 odd years, give us essentially a synopsis of uh, Ghostbusters and try and sell people that haven't seen it and make them go and want to watch this film. That's something that I can definitely do. Have you seen Ghostbusters yourself, by the way? Just a quick a quick question. Probably a dozen times. Um, Ghostbuster 2 as well, even though not, not quite as good, I still think it's a very strong film. Everything about it works for me, so. Ghostbusters 2 gets a bad rap. It does. Is it as good as the first one? It is not. It is, is it good? Very good. People often walk into the cinema when there's a sequel and they'll just have this kind of thing in the back of their mind thinking, it's a sequel. It's not going to be as good. You know, their expectations drop dramatically, but it's a great film. They're almost like two parts of the same film, to be honest. There isn't a great difference of quality between them. Same cast, different threat. They are a package deal in my mind, that's for damn sure. But yeah, talk to us about the first one. Let the people know why they should go and see it. So, so Ghostbusters, just to quickly summarise it, and I don't mean this in a negative way. In fact, I mean it in a, hum a tremendously positive way. Ghostbusters is what it says on the tin. It's a film about a group of people who hunt ghosts called the Ghostbusters. Now, that's the easy way to describe it, and it already sounds interesting, but there's so much more to the film that I, it, it deserves to be watched. Still today, it's, it's just a classic picture. Uh, essentially, it's about three friends, Ray, Egon, and Stan, who basically start a business together where they hunt Ghostbusters. But they hunt ghosts, not Ghostbusters. They hunt ghosts, and they are the Ghostbusters. Later on, they are joined by another character called as Edmore, Winston Zedmore, and it just kind of follows their trials and tribulations of how they go about their business, who the enemy becomes, who their relationships are. It's really simple. It's, it's a very easy premise to get on board with. It's a comedy, but it's got great action. It's, it's got great special effects. It's a really, really tight narrative structure. All the characters get moments, and it has a fantastic cast. Like a really, really fantastic cast. 
of course, led by Bill Murray, but it's also got Sigourney Weaver. Even the secondary characters are absolutely fantastic. Even Rick Moranis in a very small role, but even he's great. So just everybody is is firing on all cylinders. And, and I've heard a lot of people describe it as like a really lightning in a bottle film that it's very hard to recapture. And it is. It's one of those things where, and they've tried to make it again today. They've tried to do a remake. They're now making a kind of pseudo sequel. I don't know, it's very, very difficult to get that exact cast back, such a good dynamic between them all. And like you said, Ghostbusters 2 is a very good film, still not as good as the first one, but that's just because everybody in the first movie was just under 100% triple A game. So I was like a Ghostbusters fanatic when I was growing up. Uh, one of my earliest memories actually was just one of those really, really good Christmases where like, I'm not from a tremendously rich background or anything, so we, we wouldn't typically get a lot of the presents that we were like, oh, I really want this. That would not be us. But one Christmas, I remember, me and my older brother asked for the Proton Packs from Ghostbusters. And it was kind of one of those idyllic, oh my God, in a perfect Christmas, we would get this. And we actually got them. I still have them at home to this day. They're just like a little, you used to get these yellow kind of uh, things that shoot out the top. So you'd, you'd pull the back, push it forward, and the yellow piece would shoot out. And I just, that made made my childhood. I can still visualize it to this day. When you watch Ghostbusters, and maybe it seems you're a big fan, when you think about the franchise as a whole, how does it make you feel? So because I chose it for obviously one of my films to define my existence in, in isolation, in a bunker away from machines, I, I would, like, this film to me signifies what all films should strive to be. Now that's a humongous claim, so I will explain what I mean by that. The, the film is so tightly structured as the way the story works and the way the character works and the way the humour works. Everything is synchronised. So I think a lot of films these days, particularly comedies, have a tendency to not focus on the character dynamics or the characters as much in favor of maybe a quip or a line or a funny moment or whatever but ghostbusters the humor is so inherent to who the characters are that all the jokes all the funniness all the things that happen arise from situations that you can imagine those characters and those people finding themselves in and because the performances are so strong from bill murray and all that that it, it just pushes this along so easily and so naturally that i just wish even non-comedy films, even serious films, dramas and stuff, could just learn a lot about how to use your characters and how to use their personalities to drive a story and to drive engagement. Like, ostensibly, it's a film about a group of kind of schlubs <laughs> going after ghosts. And that doesn't sound like a very normal situation. But the way they play it, the way the characters play it, normalizes the whole situation. And it allows people to buy in so, so easily. So when I think of that, and especially because I, I love films, I love watching films, I love talking about films, this film in particular, I'm like, this is how it's done. This is the way to make characters. This is the way to design a story around a specific group of characters and use all those characters' personalities, use their strengths, like even write it in a way that makes sense. And to highlight this, I'm going to give it a particular scene there's a scene where the Ghostbusters are in an elevator. So it is, it, it's Bill Murray, uh, Harold Ramis, and Dan Aykroyd, which are uh, Peter Venkman, Egon, and Ray. So basically, they're all in, in an elevator together, and they're about to switch on those proton packs I mentioned for the first time. Each character gets a line, and each of them kind of signifies their personality. So Ray says a quip, and you know Egon is the scientific guy, and it's just everybody gets a, a moment to shine, but it's not undercutting the scene or it's not undercutting the seriousness of the scene. It's just perfect. And it's a, just a perfect microcosm of how that film works. And that is why it just makes me feel, you know what? Humanity can get it right sometimes. So those machines don't deserve to destroy us all because Ghostbusters gives me hope. <laughs> yeah, I think you're absolutely right as well by talking about the fact that too often in modern day filmmaking and TV character development is kind of thrown by the wayside in favour of quips. Um, we've been watching some stuff lately on the podcast, actually. I think we recently watched um, Space Force, 
and the fact that there is just no real character development it's a series of like it's like sketch show comedy one sketch and then another sketch and then another sketch i think if you invest in your characters early on it will it's like a you know in, investing in anything over time it will mature over time it will grow and that's where you get the kind of gold you can have that you can invest in characters but for whatever reason the actors don't really gel they were so lucky as you said it was kind of a lightning in the bottle moment where the interplay between them is so good i think bill murray he's very good at making that happen in kind of ensemble pieces as well that's one of his real talents as an actor he just seems to raise the game of everyone else i'm thinking of a lot of wes anderson kind of ensemble pieces as well he has that effect on a cast as a whole um yeah great choice and i think you're right humanity can it can happen and that's why we have these you know mythical films like ghostbusters where people will talk about it decade after decade after decade a lot of the stuff that gets made today i think will be forgotten you know in five to ten years particularly comedies um just not to cut across it but you you've you've described something so perfectly there that i just want to go back to it and it'll it links into ghostbusters and that kind of scene i was talking about again and how characters are used you said that space force because i'm watching it myself as well now and you said that it's it's basically like a sketch show like a sketch comedy and that's really well defined because each episode seems to focus on an entirely separate thing and just that half hour period just covers that segment that that 30 minute sketch before it moves on to the next episode which is an entirely different sketch it relies on descriptions of characters off camera for you to know who these people are it doesn't define the personalities on screen whereas in ghostbusters to bring it back to that tight writing is that what the characters say continually informs who that character is so you learn from the character's behavior and that's something in space force like you just said you don't get that God, that is a perfect description you said of space force and i was trying to put my finger on what it was but you've nailed you've nailed it on the head right there i'll, I'll take it uh, <laughs> you've you've alluded to them and i've actually got them written down as questions anyway i did want to get your opinion on the 2016 uh, ghostbusters kind of reboot that happened so this is a this is a, polit- a potential minefield. I know, <laughs> which I guess in an ap- post-apocalyptic Terminator-ridden world, there probably would be a few landmines around. So, I'll, um, do I like that film? I do not. Is it for many of the reasons people talk about? Like, kind of, you know, the ones yourself. Um, it has nothing to do with that. The, my my criticism with that film is something that I would also l- lay upon this, the, the, the Ghostbusters remake. I would also lay the same criticism upon films that I do enjoy, such as Anchorman, that again, none of the characters, the personalities don't inform the story. You don't you don't learn about a character the whole way through or find a character at a certain stage, have a journey with that character, and then they grow or develop or the inherent personality they have informs that character. It's, it's just a series of quips and a series of ad-libs which don't utilize the character's personalities. It seems like a few of the characters on set are all trying to be the funny character. And the interplay then doesn't work as well as the original Ghostbusters because Bill Murray was the more funny guy and he's allowed to be the funny guy. People don't, they're not all trying to kind of be on the same funny stage as him. So they each get their moments. But the newer film tends to be a lot of people trying to be the funny character. And I just tend then, the, the dynamics don't work as well. Plus, just as a team you don't get as much, you don't learn about them as much as you do the originals. So it's harder then to get engaged as much. When I think about, you know, the Bill Murray Ghostbusters films, I think about, yes, they're funny, but most, first and foremost, I think about the fact that the films have heart and the films have soul. And when I think about the 2016 kind of reboot remake, I just see it as they've really gone out of their way to make this just a comedy with ghosts. Whereas Ghostbusters was like, you know, a sci-fi ghost thing that happened to also be quite funny. Um, And I think, you know, they've put the cart, is it, I I always forget the expression, they've put the cart before the horse, I think. That's the one, that is the one. And it just, you know, it just kind of falls in on itself. You have to build the foundation or the structure will just collapse. And at the end of the day, they've they've missed out on the, the whole point of Ghostbusters, I think, with that film. 
I, I agree. Yeah, the, the, I think yeah, that's a they've missed out the point of the film, which is, I mean, maybe even it's to do with stuff like CGI. Because if you made the original Ghostbusters now, it would be packed with CGI, which may take a little bit of the heart away from it. But because the original was was very constrained in what it could do, it focuses on the characters, and I think that's just a a kind of thing about eighties movies and the whole. A lot of them focused on actors and characters, whereas now it just seems to be. You know, CG can do so much and the environments are so big that I think less time is put in in, in mainstream films anyway, a lot less time is put into character development. Let's move on to your second choice. So from going from a film <laughs> that potentially a lot of people have seen, I'm now going to talk about a film that potentially no one has seen uh, and that is Turbo Kid. In all of the episodes we've done so far, this is about the third thing or second thing that I have never even heard of. So please explain to me and the tens of millions of people out there who may also have never heard of it, uh, what it is. Turbo Kid is a pastiche of apocalyptic 80s movies. So it's, it's really like think of Mad Max and stuff like that. Essentially, just think of Mad Max because that's kind of what it really is. But it's about a kid living in, in a post-apocalyptic future, which I think is set in the year 2004 or something like that. And it's very, very small cast. It's a very low-budget picture, and it uses all kind of new retro-wave 80s music and focuses, again, like I said, in a very unknown cast. But it tells a really, really nice story. You mentioned the heart again. It's very, very full of heart. There's a young boy who is called The Kid. I don't even think he actually gets a name throughout and he's living in a post-apocalyptic world. He's trying to survive. They can't drink water. It's contaminated. There's not many people left in the world. And he meets this girl called Apple. And essentially, it just goes from there. And the kind of adventure they find themselves on and what happens to those two characters. It's it's very, very simple. Very, very... I, I just want to highlight this because before we move on, it's very grotesque. That's kind of one of the... I won't say selling points, but one of the, the reasons it got made is because it's so over the top gory but it's in a in a cartoony way like a looney tunes kind of you know things would never look like that it's like blood spray everywhere stuff like that almost like a kill bill in in a way just how over over the top it is so you don't feel the violence as much as you would if it was portrayed realistically but to summarize in short it's a post-apocalyptic movie about a guy called the kid and it just tells his tale what lessons do you think it's taught you about the post-apocalyptic landscape that you now find yourself in? To be fair, this film, quite aptly, I didn't think of this, but it does actually teach me a lot of a lot of good lessons in surviving the post-apocalyptic landscape. Things like don't judge people, and also don't be around too many other people because that's a bad thing to do because they could be crazy and want to kill you. It's, it's really nice because the film you said about Ghostbusters as well, about heart, and obviously that's a, a theme which is probably going to come across many of my films, is that I need a film for me to be very, 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 very likable. I need to have a lot of heart. And this does. You really, really root for the kid. You really buy into his, his relationship and his friendship with the person he meets called Apple. The characters are great to watch. It is that thing again where they start off in one position, you learn about them and then they develop and they grow and you just want them to succeed. And it's a great story because essentially they're living in a place where you can't succeed. You know, there's almost no winning. So it makes you root for them even more. The world is screwed up. They're not going to get the world back. But it's about them surviving as best they can. And the kid, essentially, because he's young, trying to retain that bit of humanity. And it's it's really clever how they do it because he's into... And obviously this is another reason I like it is that he's very much into superhero culture and he likes, he has a little superhero comic with some pages missing, but he kind of models himself on the superhero. So he's trying to strive to those ideals and, and be a good guy and help people when they need it, even if it doesn't always work out so well for him. And I mean, that's something I could probably learn from if I'm living in a post-apocalyptic landscape. Try and Try and help people when you can. So it's the combination of likeable it's got heart and the fact that it's a bit of a survival guide is the reason you'd bring it down into your bunker with you. That and that it's it's a it's a very a joyous movie. It celebrates it celebrates the nice things of life that you may not otherwise think about. Just like friendships and yeah, the enduring quality of what it means to have a friend who really cares about you. 
you brought up something where you talked about it was like an unwinnable situation. Is that what you were saying? Yep. It kind of reminds me a bit of, um, I bring this out all the time. It reminds me of like the idea of the Kobayashi Maru in Star Trek. To quote Mr. Fantastic from the Fantastic Four, we don't have to win. We just have to not lose. <laughs> um, it's interesting. I don't know if you've played um, Star Trek Bridge Crew. It's a, a PlayStation VR game. I have not, unfortunately, no. You can actually do the first mission of the game is the Kobayashi Maru test. Amazing. It's, yeah, I think I saved like 22 people and lost however many hundred souls. So maybe don't make me a captain of a starship. This film has, a, I don't know if you've heard of New Retrowave. It's it's this kind of style of basically 80s music, but made now. So it's all very synth, very synth wave. I don't know if you've seen uh, Kung Fury. This is that same kind of movement. It's got all that very 80s synth wave music, a soundtrack from La Matos, which everyone needs to check out. It's exceptional. And the very start of the film has a song from a guy called Stan Bush, who I will probably be talking about later on from another one of my films, which is an 80s classic. But this wears its, its, wears its love for the 80s on its sleeve. When the, the guy, Turbo Kid, I don't want to spoil the film, but he finds like a superhero outfit later on that he starts to wear. And it's so 80s, the colours, he has like a glove he can shoot lasers out of, which is essentially the power glove, if you've ever used the power glove for the, the SNES, I think it could have been. But that's that's just is what it is. He's wearing a power glove and shooting lasers out of it. It's like the, even the effects and all that are very, they're not good. Partly because of the low budget, but obviously that's also what they were going for to, to make it look like an 80s movie. And again, I love 80s movies and I love this kind of wave that is happening now at the moment of films aping that style. There's another one coming out soon called Blood Machines. I don't know if you've heard oh, that either. Oh, but... yes. I've seen the trailer because YouTube keeps showing me the trailer. It looks good though, right? Very good. It looks absolutely fantastic. I sent it to, um, I sent the name of it to Lex yesterday. I'd quite like us to review it on the podcast. It looks genuinely amazing. And the music is done by a guy called uh, Carpenter Brush. Uh, he did a music for a video game called Fury as well. And it is exceptional. This, so the music he does is that new retro stuff. It's excellent. The whole idea of like new retro, um, Danger Five and Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. Oh, I'm so glad you said Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. What a classic. Absolutely superb. Yeah, completely self-aware of what they're doing. Garth Marenghi is, is a show that was on Channel 4. It was only six episodes, but it's available. I think it's on all four. So everybody, if you're listening to this, check out Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. It is incredible. Just amazing writing. It's so funny. So, so funny. I, I love that show. I can see my Garth Marenghi box set from where I'm sat. Um, really fantastic show. I was very, very lucky to go to the Mighty Boosh Festival in 2007. And I was less than 50 yards away from Matt Holness. Oh, nice. Dressed as Garth Marenghi, reading a, a passage from, quote unquote, Garth Marenghi's new novel. Um, that was really very special. It's a very underappreciated TV show. And when I was there, I literally stood up and was going, more dark place, more dark place. But I don't think he heard me. It's unusual to talk to somebody about this show because in Ireland, it is virtually unknown. So it's good to hear somebody else likes it as much as I do. And all, all, the, all the cast as well have kind of gone in to be in lots of other stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like the IT crowd, a lot of the cast end up in that. And as you said, the Mighty Boosh. So a lot of the cast will be recognisable to people, but they weren't back then so that's what's interesting about it i, I almost want to like <laughs> diverge into garth Marenghi conversation but uh we've got a lot to get through so maybe it's a time maybe it's time to go on to number three you know i will use this good opportunity that we're already talking about a television show and channel four to move on to my next show well yeah so first show that i'll talk about which is father ted father ted is what i refer to as the first of the graham linehan trilogy Father Ted, Black Books, IT Crowd. Uh, we've had someone on here talk about Black Books. I love all three of these TV shows. As do I. Father Ted was something where my family in the, must have been either late 90s, early noughties, we would watch the reruns on Channel 4 quite late at night. Sell the world on Father Ted because, again, it feels like something that there should have been a lot more of and it should have a lot more recognition around the world. So Father Ted is a sitcom 
that every Irish person <laughs> knows, basically, and can quote almost verbatim and knows references. And if you mention it, people will talk about it for 25 minutes. It's about three priests who live on an island called Craggy Island in a parochial house. And it's just about their daily lives and how they go about their priestly businesses and not so priestly business. It was a revelation at the time when it was specifically on Irish television because an Irish television station, RTE, actually turned it down. So it had to go to Channel 4 to be uh, produced and made. And it made such tremendous waves about how it it depicted the Catholic Church uh, and what it does with it. So, like, all, obviously, these three priests know a lot of other priests around. <laughs> so, it's so, like, caricature. There's, like, the dancing priest. There's the cool priest. And, like, every every priest has a different stereotypical character trait. Um, it's a laugh track background, which is an unusual one to kind of chair today, I guess, because people don't seem to like them as much anymore. But it's... The comedy is so ahead of its time. And like some of the, the cutaways that they did is almost more in line with a show like Scrubs or Arrested Development. But they did it back then in a sitcom, which is which is just is mind blowing when you think about it. Um, like you said, it's it's written by a guy called Graham Linehan, who, again, in the world of Twitter, maybe don't read up too much about him anymore. Maybe don't. <laughs> maybe stay a little bit away from him. But he did some great shows. Again, Father Ted, Black Books. And the IT crowd, which is another tremendous show. But I think Father Ted, because of its enduring legacy to, for Irish people, is just, it's one of those shows I have to pick. I can't, if I if an episode is on the background, I can't help but stop what I'm doing and watch the entire thing. It's so, so funny and so good. Similarly to Ghostbusters, I feel like this is, again, a bit of a lightning in the bottle situation, but the cast cohesion is just really, really strong. It's, it's, I mean, led, but, and it's actually interesting you mentioned the cast there because I was actually going to bring this up just about how it, what it kind of means to me. And it, it's weird to say like a, a moment in time that I always remember where I was, but, but the, the lead priest, Father Ted Crilly is his name and it's superbly played by Dermot Morgan. I mean, he owns, like I could never imagine anybody else playing the role the way he did. So Father, Father Ted himself, he's, he's a well-meaning well-meaning priest i won't say he has a heart of gold because he doesn't he, he he does try to do the right thing but he takes many detours on the road to doing the right thing shall we say uh one of his famous one of his famous lines is that money was just resting in my account <laughs> which tells you kind of everything you need to know about the character but i remember where i was in a car listening to the radio when i was just a really really small kid and all of a sudden it came on that that Dermot morgan had passed away and this was crazy. To say Ireland's attention was just stopped that day was, was incredible. Like, so it was, it was a real, it just got to show the cultural impact of that show that when he died, everybody in Ireland of that age can remember where they were and remember hearing about it. But it was also weird because it's the first time on Irish television when it was being shown that we'd seen anything like this. I mean, the, 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 the Catholic Church was, was completely poked fun at. There was swears, there was curses in it. There's a specific episode where they're at a, a sheep, a kind of a sheep auction, or there's a, they're, they're trying to get these sheep ready for sheep. Do you hear me? Get sheep ready for a race, and somebody said dropped the f word in the background of a group, and I mean my parents lost it that on Irish television somebody had said the f word, like it was crazy. <laughs> in fact, it's kind of sad because a lot. A lot of the cast is actually has passed away now. Another uh, Father Jack is another one of the main priests. Frank Kelly has also passed away, so it it is kind of sad. That there's only there's only a few of them left because it's not even the show isn't it's not even that old. Like it's uh, 1997, I think it was ended in 1998, but only only three series as well. It's one of those very kind of I I'm, I'm going to say Irish slash British things, but the kind of sitcoms over this side tend to only be like eight episodes a season. It's not like you're 22 episodes a season, American shows. I think you're right on many points. I think the fact it was incredibly ahead of its time. Um, swearing, yeah, in British kind of sitcom doesn't really happen. And I don't remember where I was, but I also remember the day he passed. Um, that's interesting, isn't it? You see, that's like I said. Yeah, I mean, it was just one of those things where he seemed so young. 
happy. It wasn't like, you know, when Roger Moore passed away and you think about years and years and years ago when he was being James Bond. Father Ted was still very much in the kind of public consciousness. Um, and yeah, it was a real shocking moment. I also think it's really um, a good point that British and Irish comedy, I like that it's kind of condensed into three seasons because a lot of American stuff will kind of go off the boil and then you'd rather things go out strong where people are like desperate for more. Recent examples of that might include something like Spaced or um, The Office with Ricky Gervais. People, you know, clamouring, begging for more, but it's good to keep people interested, I think, and yeah, just always leave them wanting more. Yeah, I think the quintessential example that comes to me to the mind when I think of that is I was going to put Arrested Development on my list, but I like the first three series of that show. There's now five series, I think it is, and it just goes so far off the rails by the fifth season that I, I couldn't, in good faith, put that down as one of my favourite shows because I only like about a half of it, if you know what I mean. Do you know what's funny? I didn't actually like the, th- the third season. I liked one and two, and then I think the third was half the length because they already had troubles, and they kind of, it was very kind of rushed and just didn't feel quite right. Still some funny moments. But I I really liked season four, which is like, I'm the only one. I'm very aware that I'm the only one. And then five came out and five was honestly some of the worst television I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, and it made me incredibly sad. And it's unfortunate because when I think of Arrested Development, I can't help but think of those. Like, I, I kind of agree with you in season four. I didn't like it when I watched that first. But when I watched it the second time, it's so clever. And some of the kind of cross-cutting to do about people, characters walking to certain scenes, ETC, is incredible and shows so much foresight on half the writers that it's, it, I think it, it, it deserves to be seen the way it's originally made and not the revamped cut corners method. Like, But the fifth series, I would literally classify it as unwatchable. It would be remiss of me not to ask you what your favourite episode is. Right, so this is, there's actually a Christmas special. Oh my god, hold on, wait, 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 wait. Mine is a Christmas special as well. That's so good! It's the one where, at the very start, the, the all the priests and, like, Father Ted and Dougal and a group of other priests find themselves in a department store lingerie section. That's my one as well. It's such a good episode. Every, even the way it, it changes and the way the narrative develops is so clever and so funny. And yeah, I, I absolutely love it. And if that's your favourite episode as well, yeah? Yeah, I, I ha- had to go on the internet to look up the name of it. It's called A Christmassy Ted, but that is also mine. And we talked about pastiche. The fact that it's basically got like a kind of Vietnam feel to it. Um, there's something about um, episodes that spoof, you know, I think that's why I liked Community so much because you'd get an episode that was their space episode. You'd get an episode that was, um, you know, like the Arse Crack Bandit. It was kind of like a whodunit. You'd get the um, the paintball episodes that were like war episodes. Um, you'd get the Dungeons and Dragons episode. I've always really appreciated the kind of, that pastiche, that spoofy kind of style. Um, so the bit where they are, you know, stuck for hours in this lingerie department. God, that's just so funny. I can't believe we picked the same episode. And of course, Ted gets nominated and wins the Golden Cleric for being such a good priest. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that episode. Like, like you said, that, that spoofy bit at the start, there, there's a scene at the very end when they finally make it out. They open a door and it's like guys jumping out of a helicopter in Nam and Ted's holding the door open. It's so expertly done. The, 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 the spoofs they're doing it are so on point and so filmed with that like kind of low-key, cheeky Irish kind of low budgetness to it that it just fits it so well i think that's probably a good moment to move on to number four uh, i'm going to go to another tv show now and i mean this is very in the zeitgeist of the moment shall we say which is rick and morty are, are you are you a rick and morty fan rick and morty is something that i know i will love but as i say to many people when they tell me when they ask me if i've seen these great shows i just say there are too many great shows on at the moment and i will get around to it one day but I just have not had the time. We are in peak TV and we're in a golden age of TV. Uh, and it's just one that, yeah, I will absolutely adore. Every clip I've ever seen, I've like laughed. I think it's great. Made by Dan Harmon. I've watched every episode of Community. Fantastic show. Yeah, I know that it's something that I will absolutely embrace, but it just happened. It just hasn't happened yet. 
So for people like me and other people around the world who maybe haven't seen it, um, maybe give us a synopsis of Rick and Morty. I shall indeed. And then I'm going to go touch upon what you just said there, because in a way you're very lucky. But uh, Rick and Morty essentially is a very large piss take of Back to the Future, where it's the Doc and it's Marty. So it's Rick and Morty. It's a grandfather and his, his grandson who just explore the universe because his grandfather is Rick is a crazy scientist adventurer man who can cross parallel universes and has all this power and could do anything and his grandson is a bumbling fool who doesn't really know anything about the world and just kind of goes along with his grandfather this obviously gets him into wacky situations and when I say wacky I mean crazy off the wall mad situations I'm not gonna spoil it because I think this show deserves to be seen fresh by everybody also it's a kind of comedy so i don't really need to go into story beats but i want to touch upon what you're saying that you hadn't seen it and you you are so so lucky and i would actually recommend if people haven't started rick and morty already wait till it's either finished or wait till you have a good few series to watch together because rick and morty has become like i said very in the zeitgeist at the moment and it's become very in a way politicized that as you're watching it you're almost taking into account the context of where the episodes was released and there seems to be a lot of fan backlash to certain things and then responses to fans and you can't help but get your judgment of the show clouded a little by all this so I think it's actually a great idea to leave it for a while and watch the show in complete isolation of the context and I mean if I'm stuck in a bunker all that context isn't going to matter because the only context that's important is the T-800 knocking at my door or not knocking at my door as the case may be. So it'll probably be useful then. But yeah, I would I would very much, if you haven't started Rick and Morty, I would actually hold off on it because there's a lot of things colouring people's opinion of it at the moment. Who is this show for? Uh, this show is for someone like me. I'm, I'm its 100% perfect demographic. Uh, I'm a big Dan Harmon fan, but I'm also a big fan of Justin Ryland, who is the co-creator and co-writer. I'm a big fan of his lunacy, which is things like he did a video game called Trover Saves the Universe. But the thing is, Justin Ryland, when he's let loose, can go to some really crazy, strange, dark places that I wouldn't really, I wouldn't enjoy so much, shall we say. And because Dan Harmon he knows what he's doing with TV. He knows what he's doing with shows. He kind of keeps them on, on the straight and narrow. Like one of the best things about Community, which you've mentioned, is probably again, like the characters are very, the characters are heartfelt again. There's genuine emotion in some of the scenes. There's genuine emotion between the relationships. And I think Dan Harmon carries some of that with him to Rick and Morty, which wouldn't necessarily be there. And I, I don't want to say it's for, because there's this there's this perception that Rick and Morty is like for smart people and it's a smart people's show. There's like fart jokes the whole way through it, you know, and poop jokes the whole way through it. So it's not for just for smart people or this perceived smart people group. It's it's a Simpsons of, I don't want to say Simpsons, yeah, it's Simpsons of today, I guess I will say, because it accepts the fact that its audience is smart enough to watch it. Rick and Morty makes me feel interested, shall we say. And when I say interested, I mean interested in its portrayal of people because it's very much about what people are willing to do and how people perceive life so because rick is so almost godlike in his ability to do things and because he can go between universes and ostensibly do what he wants how do you live your life and how do you build morality around that and that's the show explores a lot of those themes so it's kind of like a a treatise on the human experience in a way that's wrapped in fart jokes and poop jokes <laughs> and lots of movie references and stuff as well there's loads of episodes that are just you know the premise of this movie that's what this episode is this episode is the purge and let's see what happens to people who haven't seen this maybe what is an episode that you think you'd recommend that might be a good example of what this show is there's one episode in particular that always comes to mind when I think of Rick and Morty because it, it really shows it at its absolute chaotic best and why this show is different from other shows. There's an episode in series three and it's set on a place called the Citadel of Ricks. So because Rick, again, can go between universes and between blah, 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 and between times and dimensions, there's a whole group 
of other ricks from around the universe that have come together to form their own society. And each one of those ricks has a Morty assigned to them. So it's just a whole <laughs> citadel full of thousands and thousands of different versions of a Rick and different versions of a Morty. And it uses that to build criticism on society and talks about how society works because obviously the Mortys aren't treated as well as the Ricks. So then it has a whole thing about a presidential race between loads of Ricks and one Morty. And it's mad. It's insane. There's a joke every 20 to 30 seconds. Many of them laugh out loud. And it's just a perfect microcosm of how that whole show works. The entire, like the madness, the lunacy of a story that starts out with just accept the fact that there's multiple versions of the one character. They're all going to interact and just get on with it. And that's Rick and Morty at its heart. That actually reminds me of uh, Planet Rimmer from Red Dwarf. Uh, that's a great, that's a perfect, perfect example of that, yes. Yeah, where it, the fact that they're all the same person is ostensibly, but still they bend over backwards to still create a class system. Why is it that this is a TV show that makes it to the bunker? Is it just that quality just takes it above everything else? It's the quality and the consistency of Rick and Morty is something that I has not been seen in animation anyway, at least since the days of the early classic Simpsons episodes. Every episode is a winner. Some of them, like it's, the ones that are really good, are just epics, masterpieces. Like whereas the lowest it falls is still absolutely amazing and hilarious and. I don't know of any show off the top of my head that I can think about like that. Even Community, and I love Community, there are episodes where the quality dips. There are filler episodes that I'm like, I probably wouldn't watch that. I'd skip it because I've already seen it. But with Rick and Morty, any episode that's on, I will happily watch. And I will laugh at it. So that's probably why it would make the bunker. Because I'm just, you would have that quality and that consistency throughout. Along with all the in-depth character analysis and the humor and all that but it's just I know that no matter which one I put on if I'm on a random episode because I'm not going to watch them all in order if I'm stuck in a bunker for life that that would get tedious knowing which episode is next so if I just went random episode I know that I would still enjoy it as much as an episode I would select myself. Favorite episode of Community? So there's a few episodes of Community that come to mind two in particular that I'm going to say and I think weird enough they're both in series five which is the ass crack bandit. <laughs> yes. Which is great. But I think because, again, me being me, the episode that's just animated like G.I. Joe and has the original G.I. Joe voices in it. I mean, that's that's like how the only way it could be more for me is if it was the animated Transformers and it was all the voices from that. But it's essentially the same thing, you know? Yeah, I'll quickly r- rattle off some of mine because I love community. Um, the one with the trampoline. All of the ones that involve paintballing and the Dungeons and Dragons one. Um, but yeah, I'm you've completely sold me on Rick and Morty. So I think you've done a perfect job. And that's probably a good time to move on to number five. I think I know what might be coming because you've just, just spoken about it. Well, I, I was going to do that later, but you know what? Now is, is, is as good a time as any to get it out of the way, I guess, because I've, I've mentioned it a few times. <laughs> and that is the <laughs> Transformers animated 1986 movie <laughs> it just makes me laugh even even to have this in a list like this but you know what it's it's who i am and it's what i like so it's okay have you seen have you seen this movie i haven't and i've got to admit i'm not even particularly a transformers fan but that's mainly due to the live action films but we'll come on to that um when do you think you first saw this film so this is a weird one because i was a transformers fan as I as a kid, like a huge Transformers fan, I have I still have toys at home. There's a Transformer looking at me right now, actually. But anyway, um, really big fan. Always was a kid, loved the TV series. But I didn't see this film, and this is probably why I have such a connection to this movie. I didn't see this film until I was in college, and college in Ireland is probably not like college in a lot of other places because it's not that crazy, carefree lifestyle coming of age thing that everyone has. I mean, it's very it's kind of dull. You just go out to college and do stuff, you know? But I remember at the end of my first year of college, sitting around with a group of friends, having a few beers, and one of the guys was like, you'll never guess what I found. A VHS tape, 
of the Transformers 1986 cartoon movie. And we were like, sure, stick it on. And the rest of the day was just spent laughing and singing the, the bloody You've Got to Touch music, which is from Stan Bush, who's the guy I mentioned earlier who does the music for the very start of Turbo Kid, because there is that pastiche link back to it. But um, like if you don't have very a lot of fondness for Transformers, it's still worth a watch. Have you seen Rocky IV? Oh, yeah. I mean, Rocky IV is an absolutely sensational film. I can also see Rocky IV from where I'm sitting at the moment. So, um, yeah, this is this is going well. So Rocky IV is a live-action version of Transformers, the 1986 animated movie. It's the same guy who does the soundtrack, Vince Nicola, that cool synth soundtrack. It's like a music video, much like Rocky IV is, just a collection of music montages. And it's just that really 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 made in its era kind of feel to it if you like rocky 4 you should definitely watch the transformers 1986 movie so basically it's set in in the year 2015 i think anyway and the autobot and decepticon war is reaching its conclusion the Decepticons have retaken Cybertron, which is the Transformers home planet, and the Autobots are going to make like a, a last ditch effort to take it back. Now, all the characters from the first two series of the original animated movie are in it. All your favourites, all the ones you used to play with when you were a kid and you had the toys of. And in the first 30 minutes of the movie, there's a big all-out war where they're all brutally killed. And when I say brutally killed, I mean you see them die on screen you see them like carrying autobot carcasses around the place and just dropping dead bodies on the ground it, it's like the first half an hour of saving private ryan it is insane and these are like characters that people brought to the cinema with them thinking like yeah my toy is going to be in this and then had to watch them be, be brutally killed even even optimus prime the main character of the transformers gets killed within the first half an hour it is it's crazy. So then it follows a, a young Autobot called Hot Rod who has to do his level best to get the universe back on track because there's this evil planet-killing monster called Unicron who's coming to destroy everything, basically. Um, yeah, I guess the kids were made of sterner stuff back in those days. That you, you, you did that on purpose, right? That's So in the fight, in the movie... Where Megatron fights Optimus Prime, Megatron gets beaten, and he's like, please, please, I surrender. And Optimus Prime says, I thought you were made of sterner stuff. It's a really famous quote from it. That is <laughs> a complete coincidence. <laughs> That's excellent. That is, yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't really imagine what the kids must have been like um, sat in the cinema seats watching that. Um, I was going to ask you, like, how, how does it make you feel? So this film is fist pumping excitement. Like it just gets the adrenaline pumping because it's pure 80s heavy rock the whole way through. Like stuff you wouldn't associate with a kid's film, but it was the 80s after all. So it's got this like really cool heavy metal pumping album and it's all really bright. The visuals, the like the animation style is really, really good and really, really high quality considering the Transformers. So it's really, oh God, it gets you. If, if I was going to go out pick up a laser gun and fight the robot threat back. I'd watch this film first and I'd be like, you're goddamn right I can do this. I've got the touch and I can go out and fight those robots. I like the um, group of emotions that you've kind of created for this, uh, these nine pieces of media, the ones we've had so far. You've got some happy Turbo Kid, which is like a kind of guide for the apocalypse. You've now got something to inspire the fight back, um, to pump you up and to see what it's like to... Um, I guess, yeah, when, when you think about it, this is a film where a lot of robots are being slaughtered. Mercilessly killed. Yeah, so it might give you the kind of motivation you need to become, you know, John Connor or Sarah Connor. I'm slightly worried about the, the, the inner conflict and turmoil because I'm like, I like the Transformer robots, but I have to mercilessly kill all these ones. But I'm sure I'll, I'll be okay with that. When the first live action film came out, the very, very first one, I remember being in the cinema with my friend in Carlo Omniplex, where I later worked for six years. I remember the first, the very, very start, that helicopter, Blackout, I believe his name is, comes down, transforms, the sound played. 
me and my friend were like grabbing each other's hands being like this is this is happening right now like and at the time I loved it I can see the folly of my ways in that look the first one is is watchable it's okay there is the odd moment like when Starscream says you know we found Megatron Decepticons come together and all you're like wow this is happening but realistically it's not a great film and the rest of them are absolute unbridled trash there's also a scene in the second film revenge of the fallen i believe it's called where you see a transformer and it has testicles really now yeah yeah they're they're, he's on the pyramids of giza i believe underneath it and john tutoro the character is is the actor looks up agent simmons jesus christ i know more about this film than i realized it's obviously just bedded in there anyway um he looks up and you just see like a transformer devastator and he has two wrecking balls smashing together and he he says i'm under the transformers testicles i like what it what is that like who wants why i just don't i just i know it's michael bay but come on man that's nobody wants to see that shit are there any lessons that you've learned from either the transformers films or the franchise as a whole well the transformers film the 1986 one is it's all about believing in yourself because the main character hot rod he, he doesn't believe he can kind of be this next hero. He doesn't believe he can take over from where Optimus Prime led. You know, he was so good a leader. But at the end of the movie, he learns that he, he can do it, you know. He can he can be the leader that we need. And he's played by Judd Nelson from The Breakfast Club. So he's got a good voice. And I just, I'm like, that's a nice message, you know. You can you can rise up when you need to and be be the hero you need to be for others. Yeah, I think vocal casting is so important in animated films and animated TV shows. Um, I did mean to say when we were talking about Rick and Morty, actually, have you seen BoJack Horseman? I've seen most of the first series. Yeah, that is something, slight slight um, divergence here. That is something I would recommend for anybody that's really into kind of uh, animated TV that's at a, at a much higher level in what it's talking about. That's one of the greatest... Um, examples of tv being able to actually start a genuine conversation about mental health uh, so i recommend that tv show as well i meant to talk to it when we talk about it when we were doing rick and morty but i'll drop it in now anyway that too has an amazing vocal cast and i think yeah we i think it's the fact that a lot of um, kind of mainstream people are now becoming voice artists i think is very important but we often forget that um even in animated TV shows, the voice is just so important. A lot of people will dismiss animation, but in, like you said, when you were talking about Rick and Morty, the conversation is changing when it comes to animated television. You've also made a really great point about, and it's kind of something that's it's so weird because it does tie into the Transformers perfectly, that, like, for example, Bojack Horseman brings a conversation up about mental health. That might have been difficult to have with an actual live action show in a way. It, it kind of, because the it looks so disarming and because the characters are like dogs and horses and blah, blah, blah. It allows people to, it almost it allows it to kind of go under the radar for a bit and then sucks you in and allows it to bring up these issues and to talk to you about these issues in a way that people don't like sometimes to hear about, you know? Does that, does that make, am I making any sense here at all? Complete sense. I absolutely agree with you. To, to tie it back to Transformers, there is a comic series, a recent comic series called More Than Meets the Eye. Um, it's by a British author who's a huge fan of Red Dwarf as well. And a lot of the issues are like Red Dwarf. But he does the same. He talks a lot about mental health and issues of like dealing with PTSD and that. But he uses the vehicle, uh, irony, but he used the vehicle of Transformers to tell serious issues or like about mental health but in a way that's disarming because it's like oh no it's okay it's about transformers you know a bit, people can look into this people can identify with this but then he uses that in a really really sensible and, and good way to have a profound conversation so i really like what you said there because i agree and i think rick and morty also has a lot of that with rick's mental state is very important throughout and how he how he approaches situations is all informed by this. So yeah, I do think animation has a really is really been used well lately. Okay, let's move on to number six. Um, well now I'm going to talk about the. I suppose I'll go to a video game first. I want to leave one of the my my last movie for a bit. Uh, Final Fantasy VII. Have you have you ever played it? 
I actually played it on the playground, would you believe? When I was very young, that was a thing we would run around and play, but I've been a PlayStation player all my life, PS1, PS2, PS3, PS4, I'm very much looking forward to the the big unveil of the PS5, but I never played it as a kid, and I've never played any of the Final Fantasy games, and I know somebody that has played many of the Final Fantasy games, uh, Lex. So again, something that you two have in common, liking the Final Fantasy franchise. Um, for those who haven't played it, and I know every Final Fantasy game is entirely different, they all have a character called Sid, Lex and I kind of discussed that when he was a podcast away, um, maybe give us just a sense of what the game is. Final Fantasy VII is a game that seems like it should have been made today. It is essentially about a character called Cloud. He starts off joining an underground movement that are very eco-friendly and they're about the planet and they're trying to destroy an evil corporation called the Shinra Corporation who are sucking the planet dry of, of Mako is what it's called. It's essentially the planet's lifeblood. The story starts off very small and then obviously Cloud meets lots of other characters. It builds into something much greater and it's all about the planet. What we need to do to save the planet, it's very, very corporation bad <laughs> you know I mean stuff like that kind of taking it down they're destroying the planet but it's very interesting because today's political climate and the way today's world is is very much in line with the themes that that uh, video game had in 1997 now I know there was a remake this year which I am yet to play but in a way I don't know I'm kind of scared I'm kind of scared to play it if that uh, makes any sense because, like, my formative years, Final Fantasy VII was, it dominated my life. I I obsessed over it. I just love everything about it. The characters were so deep. It was a game you could completely lose yourself in. And because of that, because it's so near and dear to my heart, I'm like, I'm almost afraid of playing the new version because it might change my memories or change my association with it. And that's a really terrible way to think about it but because I hold those memories so so dear to me and again they were my childhood I used to talk about the game all the time I used to pretend I was cloud I mean it was, it was you know I mean even my, my, my brother you and I used to sit down and he'd watch the game as I played it on I didn't even get it for the PlayStation I had it for the PC when it was first released and so that that game is a really just important part of my childhood and my memories of childhood so I'm a little I'm like so it's so backward to think, but I'm like so scared that they might encroach upon my childhood memories. Because I hold it so dear, I'm looking, I'm looking for differences and I'm looking for reasons to not like it. And to be like, the original is better, the original is superior in every way. And that's not the right attitude to have about a game like that at all. Because it looks, it looks like they've poured hours and hours of lovingness into it because it looks incredible. So... Yeah, I don't. I don't want myself to be stupid and spoil it for me, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. How does it make you feel when you think back of it? Is it just a real memory of childhood, and is by extension is that the reason it comes down into the base? You know, if you're having such a bad time, it's something that would just remind you of what the world used to be like. This game is it. It it's my childhood condensed into a three to four disc experience. I, I can't help but just think I, I get overwhelmingly sad because of like a lot of the content that's in the game there's a chord of music from it that if I hear I'm like oh god I can't go outside for the next 48 hours without maybe potentially breaking down it's so it's so laden with memories and triggers that it, firstly it's why it comes down to the bunker with me but it's 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 so it's so dear to me it's it's I, I don't know if I have any other form of media that is so ingrained in my personality. My brother and I would always play games together when we were younger. We always played Sonic and grew up playing the Sonic games, the Mega Drive, two players. But this was the first game that was almost wholly my experience. That he didn't play it. He'd watch me play it occasionally and stuff. But this was me. This was my personality starting to assert itself to a level that this is my experience now. You know, this is this is me expressing who I am as a person and I, it, to me it still has that impact that when I see that game in a way I'm like that's my game that's I had that experience which is weird but it's yeah it's the only game I can think of that that has that power 
what does gaming mean to you so so for me i i grew up with story games they were my i I loved single player narrative driven things they were my whole all i used to care about whereas now i definitely probably just because i have less time for it i'm much more into multiplayer games i i like jumping on with a group of people chatting on on headphones and earphones and chatting with groups and this will kind of inform another conversation for one of the games i'm going to bring up later i really miss the days of those couch co-op games when you're sitting around with people or sitting with somebody beside you playing like a game together and you're kind of like shouting what are you doing where are you and kind of helping each other out now final fantasy 7 wasn't that but again that was because i think my personality was forming on an individual basis that i because i was very young when i was playing that so i needed to do that first but yeah that's so, so gaming was about single player narrative driven experiences and me very individualistic but has now moved on to a much more you know cooperative everyone together friendship thing yeah when i was younger it was about the couch co-op you know i'm thinking of going to somebody's house and playing like golden eye on an n64 or something but i do enjoy you know maybe if it's cod maybe it's something else just doing some some teamwork stuff um i think what have i been playing multiplayer recently crash team racing was something i played the last thing i played that was kind of multiplayer online and um, the fact that you know in this day and age you can play against people from all around the world is great fun as well um but yeah i take great pride in getting trophies as well on the playstation um what consoles have you had throughout your life Ooh, oh, this is going to definitely, uh, it's like carbon dating here now. I'm going to, like rings on a tree. Uh, I've had the, I was always a Sega fan when I was growing up. So I was a Mega Drive. That was my first console. That's where obviously my love of Sonic came from. Then I moved on to, I actually skipped the PlayStation generation altogether. Never had a 32-bit console because we got a personal computer. A Gateway 2000 is what they were called. So I moved to PC gaming for a while before going back to the the Sega Dreamcast, which is a console that everybody should... I got mentioned in the latest uh, Rick and Morty episode, which was hilarious, but it's a console everybody should try and find somewhere or, you know, find an emulator. I didn't say it out loud, but because it's worth playing. So many amazing games. Then, uh, Then, obviously, I just moved from a Dreamcast to an Xbox 360, then to a PlayStation 4, which I, which I have is my current, my current machine. Um, let's take it back to Final Fantasy for a second. This was this was four discs back in the PlayStation One days, which was kind of there were a few others, but it was kind of you know a very big deal at the time because that was just that's a, that's a lot of money, that's a lot of bang for your buck. Was this a kind of Skyrim of the time? Do you think that is an absolutely excellent description of it? Yeah, it, it completely. Even even down to the fact that Skyrim has been reprinted is not the word but reproduced on so many different forms of media like consoles and stuff which final fantasy 7 was as well because it was ported to playstation the pc was on the playstation portable obviously it's available now for the, the playstation 4 you know so it was it was put on loads of different consoles and always gained new life so that's a really good descriptor to say it was the skyrim of its day even the level of what you could do in it for the time and the freedom and the sense of adventure you got from it was so massive I was so, you can do all these things in a video game. I remember when I was young and I had the American Spider-Man comics, so the little the little small ones, we didn't really have them over in Ireland. It was not a thing you could get. So if you'd saw one in a shop, you're like, oh my God, I'm grabbing that. And I remember having ads for the 1997 release of Final Fantasy VII and the tagline was like, like a deer caught in headlights and I had a picture still from the FMV and I was like oh my god this is incredible and how many hours if you had to guess do you think you poured into that game again much like when you talk to people about Skyrim it's like a religion almost you know they get incredible amounts of enjoyment out of it just living in that world and maybe that's why I, I put it so much in my childhood and say it was my childhood because it literally sucked so much of your hours that it actually was your childhood. Your childhood was playing Final Fantasy VII. The first time I played it, because of just the nature of the type of game it was, it just naturally took long. So it took about 60 hours to, to actually play. But instead of maybe lessening those hours when I replayed the game, which I've done a good few times, I actually put more time into it because you end up looking for the cra- the crazy 
amount of secrets that are in it. The different things you can do in the kind of end game scenario with different bosses everywhere. And some of them are just the things you have to do to get to a boss fight are crazy. And even finding new things. You could, because you have a party of three at all times, you could mix up the characters you had in your party. Which would lead to different story things, would lead to different narrative choices, would lead to different character options, different structures, different writing, etc, etc. And because when I was younger and playing it, I was like, no, these are my characters and I want these. You get a lot more from it playing it again because you're constantly swapping and changing. You're getting different interactions. You're coming across completely random story beats that you've never had before. So I've put a quite a lot of hours, quite a lot of hours into this game over my lifetime, to be honest. So When you're in your bunker, you get a copy of Watchmen. And you get a copy of 1001 films to watch before you die, which I would guess would be kind of a bit of a tease when you're <laughs> when you've got no access to them, but it'd still be fun, uh, fun reading. What is the third book that you will have in the bunker? That's interesting that I get Watchmen. Oh, hmm. I have interesting thoughts on Watchmen. But anyway, sorry, that's aside the point. Um, so I obviously read a lot of comics and I don't I'm not a huge reader of, of just normal books, but what I would go for um, is 1984 by George Orwell. What a great choice. That is in my top three novels of all time. So absolutely outstanding choice. Um, I guess, give us a very brief synopsis. Big Brother, bad. Humanity, not good. <laughs> so basically there's just kind of like everything you do, everything humanity does is watched and catalogued. There's a really oppressive state and there's only a small number of, of, of states left. And you, all you can do is go about your life and be judged and be monitored. So just don't make any, don't be different, don't stand out and just do your business. But the story follows a guy who works in one of the places, the Ministry of Truth, I believe. And it's about basically, does he see a shred of hope and a way out? But can you do that? Can you hope? Is that dangerous? And the story just unfolds about what happens to this particular character. And it is extraordinarily bleak. I used to do this thing where I'd try to get people to read it and they would say no. And so I would say, watch the film Equilibrium, which on the back of the DVD box is is described as 1984 meets The Matrix. Which, let's be honest, that is not a bad description it's of that film. It's a perfect film. description. It's an absolutely perfect. It might be the best film description of all time in that kind of um, style. Yet, excellent choice. If you ever get too happy watching Dumb and Dumber, you can depress yourself by watching some 1984 um, or some readings from 1984, I should say. So I've never, there is actually a film of 1984 with John Hurt. I haven't seen it. I'm probably not going to watch it because as I said, it is a oppressively bleak book, but there's also so like so many moments of humanity and why humanity is important. It's just that what I will say about the narrative of 1984, it's so clever because it tells you throughout the book, it just tells you don't do this particular thing and you can't help but as a person reading this book you can't help but do that thing that it, that it tells you not to and then that has a particular outcome in the end that you're like oh well I guess I should have seen that coming in a way and it's so clever it's just so amazingly clever how it does it okay let's talk about your luxury item so this is gonna this is people are not gonna get this people are gonna be like really that's your luxury item but I mean, I am probably, I've mentioned heart a lot today, so I am a fairly sentimental person at the back of it all. And my luxury item would be my transformer that's looking at me right here. It's it's Rodimus. It's all old Rodimus. He's been with me through an awful lot in my life. A lot of years, a lot of places, a lot of live different relationships, living different places, ETC. This guy has been the kind of, a constant for me, you know what I mean? And I have a I have a tendency when like a like a very, very close friend of mine or something, maybe they move away to a different country or again, my brother I've mentioned before, I always have a tendency to kind of give them a little thing that like a little toy I used to like or a little thing I had and kind of Rodimus here is is one of the last ones that I have. So he's kind of, he means a lot to me because he's, like I said, he reminds me of different periods of my life when I was in different situations and different places. So he kind of reminds me where I came from and I guess that would be useful in a bunker, when the Terminators have taken over, it's kind of nice to have something that's like, you know, I've been consistent with you, buddy. 
you've you've been there. You're the same person. You're 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 always there. You know that's kind of important. I can see some you know Funkos around here. I can see some little Mighty Boosh uh, figurines. Um, I can see some Assassin's Creed figurines here. So yeah, I get that, and I think I think a lot of people would get that actually. I think a lot of people would understand the sentimentality behind an object such as that because it's it's not an object. It's there's almost a it's almost like a Toy Story situation where you think as a you know a persona there, um, somebody that's there for you. So yeah, I can understand that. Yeah, because there is there is a like a connection to you, and it's one of those things which is weird. And this is feeds back into the films and stuff I chose because Ghostbusters was there, Transformers was there, Terminator was there. I, I think the world is different now and I think things were before if you looked at a film as a kid and had like a kid's film and had a connection to it that was just naturally dwindled with age but now it's very different because you can you can keep that kind of relationship alive because even there's all these very like I mentioned that Transformers comic it's actually very adult in what it deals with there's a Ghostbusters Transformers crossover there's a Transformers Terminator crossover and I think it's more acceptable for these things that were very much considered childish before, now that people have grown up with them, that they've actually released versions that are for adults. So it's a very different experience that people are having now. So kind of means something to me as well of where I am in my life. Ross, thank you so much for being on the show today. Um, I've had a really great time talking to you. We've been talking for about two hours, uh, two, two and a quarter hours. Happy days. This has been absolutely fantastic. Um, everybody please go and check out i understood that reference podcast um yeah captain america's on the front of it so you'll hopefully recognize him um yeah thanks for being on the show thank you thank you so so much for for having me jules and geez this is i i love the whole idea of this thing i really really do because i think like even like i said about games and tv shows and, and stuff to get like I love talking about them and I love hearing other people talking about them with passion and that's something I've noticed about listening to your other episodes it's so great to hear people talking about stuff like the X-Men cartoon like I said but just with passion that's what I really really like I just love I love people talking about things that they love themselves and aren't afraid to be passionate about these things things on a TV whether it's TV shows films games they get a bad rap a lot of the time and what I've learned so far on the five episodes that I've recorded is TV and film and games bring people together. And I think that's really important now. I think it's really important in the future. People have taken us on a journey. And yeah, I'm planning to do a lot more of these. So yeah, I'm just looking for new people to come and share. I think whatever your fandom is, I think everybody can relate to the passion, even if you know you're more of a Harry Potter than a Lord of the Rings or you're more of a Magneto than you are Lex Luthor. People can still relate to the passion. Passion sort of transcends the fandom. And yeah, we should be looking for reasons to bring ourselves together as a species uh, rather than kind of tear ourselves apart. So, And t- thank you for... Because you seem to genuinely have this passion and, to, and to, bring, to bring people and to give them the opportunity to talk about these things and, and trying to find what makes them... I don't want to say what makes them tick, but what makes them who they are and how these experiences made them who they are. It's really, really great. So like, keep doing this. It's brilliant. Really, really brilliant. And thank you for having me on, really. You're very welcome. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, yeah, we'll hopefully be back soon with another podcast away.